This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for How to Super Age with Elise Marie Collins. And Elise, I know our friends and listeners all know that you are on the West Coast. So we just want to ask, are you all safe from all the rains and all the mudslides? Definitely. I am here and we're enjoying gorgeous weather because it clears out the pollution, all that rain and all the flowers and and grasses and everything is beginning to bloom. And so we're doing okay. That's wonderful. So who do you have for us today as we uh, are into the new year? I'm going to introduce you to a fabulous author, Barbara Graham. And before we get started, I just wanted to hold up my book because I think we missed this last time. Chakra Tonics, Essential Elixirs for the Mind, Body, and Spirit. And this book teaches you a lot about your chakras, which is a metaphysical interface to your body and spirit, connecting everything, connecting the dots. And it also has wonderful tonics, elixirs, and teas that are good for your mind, body, and spirit. So you can learn a lot and get healthy, quick and easy recipes for all of your energy centers. You can learn more about them here. And I think we're going to learn a little bit about energy and writing. I'm so excited to talk to our guest today. Um, Her name is Barbara Graham, and I met her through the Women's National Book Association. I'm the president of the local chapter. It's a national organization. And Barbara Graham is an award-winning journalist, playwright, and memoirist. Her book, What Jonah Knew, is a metaphysical murder mystery. The People magazine called Riveting. It's her first novel. And what Jonah knew is about the unbreakable bond between mothers and sons, even when it seems like the bond is beyond repair. And the novel raises metaphysical questions about life and death and what happens in between. And interestingly enough, you don't know this, but um, both uh, Karen and I are mothers of sons. So I'm wondering uh, if you have children and that played a part because you're in your in your novel because there's so much insight about motherhood. I enjoy that in your book. Yeah, um, absolutely. I am the mother of a son um, who's now grown and actually the father of two daughters, but 100%. Um, my raising of a son. So in the novel, there are two mothers and and two sons. Um, One of Helen, who's one of the mothers, is searching for her missing son, Henry, and heartbroken and in despair and will do anything she possibly can to find her son. And Lucy is the mother of young Jonah, who starts to make very strange statements at a really early age and seems to know all kinds of stuff about Henry that is quite uncanny and that he has no earthly way of knowing. So I I think in, in, you know, so much of my writing, both as a journalist, as a memoirist, certainly as a playwright, has been informed by being a mother and motherhood and you know, sort of the high wire act, we, um, that is the life of, of a mother, you know, sort of letting your children out into the world and trying to protect them at the same time. And it's an ongoing dance that I'm here to say doesn't really ever end. Uh, I am (laughs) HO. (laughs) Because <laughs> my my, if I tell you how old my son is, he's 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 not a he's not a young dad. He's my son is fifty one, and because I know you do a lot about aging, I just want and you probably don't know this about me. What Jonah knew, which I will hold up, um, and has a few little post its in it, was is my first novel and was published when I was seventy four years old. I'm now seventy five. Very good. I love that. <laughs> so it kind of fits in with your sort of super aging topic, I think. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know your age. Um, 
You are um, a great example of purpose and passion at any age. And so I applaud that. I w- I'm wondering um, what led to this novel. And it is inspiring because, you know, some many authors don't get started till later or some of them don't ever get started because they maybe think it's too late. So tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you've been a writer. I don't know how long, but you've done a lot. And I'd love to hear you're a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and that's a, an honor to have you on the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about your career and how you ended up writing this novel at age 74. Yeah. So published at age 74, conceived of, and it came in Mm -hmm. as kind of a download in the 1990s. I was living in New York City, um, working as a freelance magazine writer, as well as a playwright. I had a couple of plays produced off Broadway, and I got an assignment for Self Magazine, where I was a contributing writer or editor, one of the one of the two, to do a story on past life regression therapy. So I trotted off to the Upper West Side, because most of what I've written much has been sort of essay form, writing from my own personal experience. So off I went to a workshop with a Jungian analyst, very well known for his work with past life regressions. His name was, he's passed away, Roger Wolger. And he'd written a book called Other Lives, Other Selves. I'd heard him speak at the Open Center in New York and decided, okay, this was a great guy for me to do a workshop with, well, so off I go to the workshop. There are about, I don't know, 30 of us lying on mats in a church basement and he does, you know, a relaxation and visualization and kind of, you know, leads you to see yourself at another time and place in a scene. All around me, people were having unbelievable, deep experiences. Me, nothing. Like, I'm (laughs) absolutely nothing and I felt like a complete failure as a hypnotic subject. So, but I still had to write this story for self. So I made an appointment um, to see, have a private session with Roger and took the bus up to his home, which was in New Paltz, New York. Um, And I walked in and I said, Roger, I'm really sorry, but I will probably be your first flop as a hypnotic subject because I I don't know. Anyway, he he was very kind. He said, no worries. You know, so I lay down on the sofa, closed my eyes, and he did the kind of relaxation regression again. And this time, however, I tapped into something right away. I had a vision of myself, or at least a woman I took to be myself being killed during the Holocaust. And it was a brutal memory. It felt like a true memory and really disturbing. But it, and, and I mean, I cried on in his office. And then for days afterward, it was really tapped into something very deep in me that felt real and true and familiar. And because all my life as a very young kid, I'd been kind of obsessed with the Holocaust. I'd read many, many books about it. Uh, it, it was, even though I, I'm Jewish, but I didn't have family members that I knew of, though probably I did, who were killed um, during the Holocaust, but it felt really true. But at the same time, I didn't know quite how to process it, what to make of it. A few days after the session, I went to see my own therapist at the time, uh, uh, a psychiatrist who's very well known as sort of a Buddhist psychiatrist, Mark Epstein. You may or may not have heard of Mark, and who I worked with. And I went to see him, and I expected him to ask me to, you know, kind of explore the symbolism of this memory. Instead of that, he handed me a book, which I have over here in my bookcase, by Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia Medical School, 
<clears throat> who for decades had been exploring, investigating young children with spontaneous memories of a previous life. They had accumulated at that time more than 2,000 cases that were really compelling. I was completely blown away by this material. Stevenson didn't really study adults who had been regressed because you know, he, uh, it was his point of view that there's so many influences that come in as adults, but young kids at the age of two or three who suddenly start saying, I have another mom, I have another family, I miss my mom, can we go see my real mom? You know, this isn't the food I ate, this is all, all kinds of things. And what they remember in great detail, because 75% of the kids studied have recall being uh, dying young, suddenly and violently, which makes a lot of sense when you think if we all, if you take, accept the notion that we all have had successive lifetimes, then those who whose lives have been suddenly cut short are more likely to have some residual memory like PTSD mm -hmm. than someone who dies in their sleep at 93 or, you know, so that the with unfinished lives and that seemed to be the case with most of these kids. At the so, so there was my session with Roger Wolger, there was this material with Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia. And at the time I was also hearing a lot of Tibetan Buddhist teachers talk, uh, among them the Dalai Lama, and they talk about past lives the way we might talk about, you know, next Christmas or last Thanksgiving. Uh, I mean, it's just taken for granted and part of the, the deal. And, and as someone who's Jewish, I'd also, when I was a teenager, had read uh, The Wisdom of the Zohar, which is the Jewish Kabbalah mystical tradition where reincarnation is also taken for granted. So all of these streams and forces kind of came together in my mind as I was walking down the street in New York City and the book came, the, wow. the, the, the story just kind of dropped in and wow. And I knew I had to write it. Now this was in the mid nineties. So <laughs> and I, I was a lot younger in the mid nineties. I was in my late forties at the time. And I've done other books since and other things, but for a number of reasons, including moving across the country uh, and all kinds of stuff, I wasn't able to complete it. And just as mothers of sons, writing some of that material was very difficult and scary. And that was part of it too. Wow. So, so that's a long answer. It was a long answer, but it was riveting. It was very, very interesting. Um, uh, I before I get into some of the other subjects, I just wanted to ask you, did you live in the Bay Area before or were you from you said you're from New York? How did you because the Bay Area is a part of the book as well? <laughs> yeah, I I did. Um, I lived I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Oh, I was born in Pittsburgh, then grew up in the suburbs of New York, went to college in New York. And then, like many people of my generation, migrated west, ended up living in San Francisco, divorced my son's father when he was two. Uh, we were actually at the time living in Mountain View, which was before Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Then I And then I lived in San Francisco, and he grew up in San Francisco. Um, and I, I married my second husband, who was a magazine editor and became something of an editorial army wife. <laughs> so <laughs> I was a freelancer. So we moved from New York in the late eighties and were on the East Coast for 25 years. He worked um, at 
uh, Sports Illustrated, People, um, and then he was the editor in chief of AARP's publications in DC. For uh, so we were in DC, and then came back. Um, Wow. So and I'm very happy to be here. And yeah, the Bay Area is in the book. And my next novel is really going to be set kind of West Marin, Point Reyes area. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I'm familiar with all those areas. There's, oh, and I have to say something. This is maybe um, warning. This is kind of boring for the listeners. But when you said New Paltz, um, my stepdaughter lives in Kerhonkson, which you have to take the is it i don't know the bus or the train to new paltz bus. i can't remember the bus yeah to get to her place and i always forget what those cities are but that's one of them so <laughs> i'm familiar with both areas but not as familiar with upstate new york and so i'm wondering i know that you are uh you've told me briefly you're a meditator uh i know that tara, tara brock is one of your gave you a blurb for your book and i think there might be another she's a heavy hitter meditation teacher um how did you start meditating and and how did that you know play into your writing because your writing is amazing and i would say probably meditation if anything um just brought more clarity and and just i don't know i i love yeah. meditating and i have it in my book how to super age but tell us about how you started meditating uh -huh. How I, I was always drawn to Eastern traditions, but actually it wasn't until I moved back from the Bay Area to New York that I really became immersed, um, both uh, on one hand in Zen and the other hand in Tibetan Buddhism and so and began meditating, I would say late 80s, uh, probably. And um, yeah, I just think it opens the body, mind, spirit in a way to receive um, what the universe might be offering up. Um, it, so I think in that sense, it really does play a role in this book. And in the book, reincarnation is viewed through the lens both of um of the research that stevenson did there's also inherited family trauma but also through the lens of zen and tibetan buddhism because they view uh reincarnation very differently whereas tibetan buddhism it's spoken about a lot in zen they don't talk about it they don't mess with it um even though it it's understood because the emphasis is so strongly on right now, this moment, you know, whatever isn't occurring in this moment is past or future and not relevant. So it was kind of fun and interesting to be able to play with the different Buddhist traditions uh, in terms of reincarnation. Yeah, I like that. It, you know, you could be, and that's why the story works so well because you you're reading a story if you know you don't have to quote unquote believe anything <laughs> uh and and yet it just uh paints it you know it, it rings true <laughs> it really rings yeah. true it's a great thank story you. thank you i mean one of the things i really wanted to do was write people who were not schooled in you know meditation or knew nothing about reincarnation, including Matt, Lucy's husband, and Jonah's father, who's a doctor and has that medical model materialist view of the world. So it felt really important to be able to tell the story of this strange, these strange occurrences to people who didn't necessarily, you know, deal in the woo-woo realm. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting too. And and also uh the having that point of view where somebody might have to put on a professional, you know, a lot of people might have these experiences uh but they don't talk about them or they bury them. You know, it seems like something you don't want to go, especially if you're a doctor, <laughs> you don't want to go around telling people. Um I just was in I just had a uh 
an appendectomy and wow yeah well it was back in September (laughs) not that long ago and you know I I had this feeling in the moment the doctor sort of treated me just as a physical entity just like kind of like a piece of meat right and at the same time he he demonstrated and he seemed like he's really good at that you know he's really he seemed like he's really good at that but but his other skills of empathy and you know things that you might develop in meditation were not present yeah so that's, yeah it's that's tough and i think especially if you have emergency surgery which my, most appendectomies are yeah you can't you know sort of cultivate a relationship or choose a more enlightened practitioner to to do the surgery so yeah yeah luckily i have i had other support but i um yeah i got through it i just figured he's going to do the mechanics i'll do the spiritual on my yeah. own <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. I, I avoided, you know, I was like, should I tell him what he's doing? No, I, I wrote a little comment card, but you know, it's like figured that's, that's what he was trained in. Yeah. Not looking at a spirit in a body, but just looking at a body. Yeah. yeah. That's hard. Hopefully medicine is taking a, you know, a bit of a left turn to incorporate the spirit uh yeah. in in and the soul whatever in but yeah yeah and it seems to be but it's it's very you know you can't yeah. count on that right i agree i mean i don't want to get too sidetracked but i i just my download was that it's just we're just not ready for this full you know this is this is the old model we're sort of <laughs> Maybe we're releasing it out. Maybe it'll stay around, but uh, I can see space in um, hospitals and medical centers for more spiritual healing and meditation. Uh, But I want to get back to the book because uh, I love um, the way you have different generations of characters and also that we talked about the bond between mother and son how do you develop your characters cuz that was really a highlight for me i love great characters and the places are like characters too yeah um you know it, i kind of start i started with lucy i started with when i had this download walking down the street i imagined so what would happen if my kid suddenly started making these comments about remembering a former life and having another mother? And how, how would I respond to that? I, I don't know that I would like it that much, you know, and that because I think most of us consider, you know, one child, one mom, or, you know, our lives are bookended by birth and death, and the kid is ours. Um, So I started with that question, and with Lucy, who's Jonah's mom, but very soon, as I was writing it, Helen took on more and more importance. Um, Henry's mom, uh, who's searching for Henry and dealing with the loss her missing son and the gaping hole in her life so you know they evolve and they evolve over time and they talk to you and you have to let them in and i ended up writing so many scenes that really were developmental of character that i ended up cutting because they didn't serve telling the story but were essential for my own process of knowing who I was writing about. Mm, Yeah, I love that. And the, yeah, the characters are rich for everyone. I wouldn't have known you started with Lucy, but yeah, because Helen, Helen plays such a big part. (laughs) And Helen just became more and more important. And the originally Lucy, it started the book with Lucy. And then I made that shift and it helped the story enormously 
and it was a little hard to do, but then it just was so clear it was the right way to go. And that just is part of the process. Yeah. And, and I love that you're, you know, I'm sure again, the meditation, the, the work that you've done in and that's attachment and letting go. And essentially that seems like a lot of what the story is about on some level. It even reminds me of something that happened to me last week that I think everyone can relate to. Uh, I think a spiritual teacher or somebody I was talking to, maybe I heard it on a podcast, but they were saying, you know, if different generations, if your child, you, your parents or any configuration were in a car accident and everyone died at once, you'd all just go back. Your roles would be dissolved, so to speak. So from that viewpoint, you know, our roles, we get very attached to our roles. I'm my son's mother. Yeah. yeah. And then this happened to me. My mom said something, <laughs> said something a little bit. Yeah. I'll say it was sharp and biting and like, Oh, where'd that come from? And, and then later I said, why did you say that? And she, she said something like, you know, we had went through some talk about it. And then she said, well, you're my daughter. And I was like, oh, she's really, you're my, yeah, you're something, you're my child. Like it was very interesting because she doesn't always act like that, but I could just see in that moment, her attachment to her role. Yeah, that that's, that's so interesting. And, and, and speaking of mothers, you know, when my mother was dying and I was, I was with her, um, a lot of a lot during the process of over many weeks, I, I, I realized that as children too, as daughters, we that role thing is so strong, and we see our parents in relationship to us. We don't really see them as independent beings, and that really shifted for me with my mother as she was dying, that I saw that that role was dissolving mm -hmm. and she was not functioning anymore as my mother. She was a woman on who had had the life she had. She was 95 years old. She was on her own journey of, you know, from this life to, you know, beyond and it, there was something so freeing about that um, understanding that yes these these roles that we have had in this lifetime no longer yet in some ways they continue after death as well and you know so that's but that's a whole other <laughs> way of looking at it right right did you have a question or a comment, Karen? I see you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I haven't read the book yet, um, but I have a very close attachment to both of my sons, but specifically to my youngest son, who um, has just been through a lot of PTSD situations in his <laughs> life. And he has just moved away really for the first time. And my first reaction was, who am I? Mm -hmm. You know, he lived with us for 32 years, you know, and it was like, I'm his mother, but he's moving over a thousand miles away and he's probably never going to move back home again. And really, it doesn't make sense for him to ever move back home. And um, I was glad that I had a group of very strong women around me that I could talk through it. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I mentioned it to both of my brothers and they said, well, your kids grow up. You grew up and moved away. And it was like, let's not be frivolous. There's something that, you know, I need from all this. Um, and it's interesting how fathers feel differently. It's almost like, hurrah, look at him. He's a man now some fathers i would say my son not so much that my son had been living in italy there's it's a complicated story but he just moved back here to be with his daughters um and made some great sacrifices to do that because and he's divorced and it just it felt 
not right for him to be with them. They're both teenagers right now, 13 and 16. But I, I, I understand that that identity as mom is so strong. And I have to work with that still. And my son is 51 years old. And, you know, because I see stuff and, and, and things with his kids and, and struggles that he has. And I have to keep reminding myself, he is on his own path. This is his story. I can love him, be present for him, but I am not the author of this story. Right. And it does require remembering that again and again and again, because the impulse, I think, right. is to jump in. Absolutely. It's yeah. So strong. Yeah, he called me about something really important yesterday, and I found myself just sitting on this end of the phone going, okay, all right. Um, and he said, well, you're not going to tell me what you think I should do? And I said, not really, because truthfully, I don't know. I said, but I'm here to support you. And uh, I think he was taken back by it as much as I was, because living here it was very easy to say, you know, don't you think you should be doing this or doing it this way? Yeah. 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 But what a perfect response. Yeah. yeah. It, and it felt perfect. good too. Yeah. It frees you um, as well as, as them. And they need that kind of, um, it, it's kind of offering them a sense of trust and faith that they can, they can handle whatever. Exactly. I love that. That is such great wisdom. <laughs> yeah. It also makes me feel better too, because there was something my son said to me, he was with his girlfriend and it was a, a situation he handled at a job. And I was like, Oh my God, you did what? <laughs> he was kind of a manager and he, he like grabbed something from these young, they weren't even that much younger, but um, I was like, okay, I wanted to give him a lecture, but I just didn't say anything. I, I just couldn't. Sometimes you can't say something from a neutral perspective because it also reminded me of me. You know, it was like, I would have that, like, I'm nice, nice, nice. And then suddenly I snap and that's <laughs> what I saw. So I love all this wisdom because I want to tie it back to super aging and really just aging well. Uh, we're all going through life and we have these sort of, constellations, family constellations around us. In gerontology, we call it um, the life course. And we're sort of moving. There's one theory that talks about we're moving in convoy. You know, I like that idea. We're moving along with different people and some of them just kind of go off and they come back. And so I love all this wisdom and we do need to be attached, you know, because that to be in that convoy, convoy, to be in that group, we need to be attached to our family members. That's important, too. As you said, um, your son moving back. Um, I mean, I'm kind of extrapolating that. I don't know why he moved back, but we want to be attached. We want to form those bonds. But then we also have to let go. <laughs> it's a dance. It's just. You know, and, and, and the nature of the bond changes a little bit from what you just said, Karen, like from, you know, being all in with advice and, you know, offering how you think they should do whatever it is to supporting and giving them the, letting them know that you have absolute faith in their ability. Actually, that's something Tara Brock is a friend of mine. And that is something the meditation teacher and that's something when I was going through some very worrisome thing with my son, that she really recommended she's also the mother of a son that giving that sense of faith and belief in their capacity to handle whatever it is, is a great gift. So yeah, I try to do it. I'm not always successful. <laughs> hey, well, we're human. We're not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's Absolutely. beautiful. 
Yeah. I have one last question and I wanted to find out before I forget this question, I wanted to know, is there a resource you might recommend? Because I'm sure there are many that are listening and are like, hmm, I'm not sure about the past life thing, or they're just kind of, maybe this is the first time they've heard about, you know, being mainstream or something. So where would you direct somebody who wants to learn about, you know, study, even research, anything about past lives? Um, books by Ian, Dr. Ian Stevenson. His successor at the University of Virginia Medical School is a man named Jim Tucker. Uh, also, he was a child psychiatrist and works with these kids. Um, there's a book called, and I have it somewhere, by Carol Bowman called Children's Past Lives. Carol, when her own child, she's started talking about remembering a past life at a very early age, began looking into it and became a therapist herself working with young kids. She has a wonderful book. Um, there is, uh, there's actually a Facebook group called Signs of Reincarnation that's based on the science. Uh, I think you have to join, but I, I don't see, I just, there are 70,000 plus members of this Facebook group called Signs of Reincarnation based on the research and Stevenson's work. So those are all sources um that are that can be good yeah thank you for sharing that with us yeah. that i think is very important for this podcast and my final question uh well we're going to ask about where we can find your book but i wanted to know uh from your perspective how has learning about past lives and you know this this rich relationship you have how has it helped you beyond you know anything else like what what about believing or no having this knowledge that we have lived before or we may have lived before whatever your belief system how has that helped you in your life because it sounds like you've heard about it for a long time mm -hmm. you know it, it's actually been very helpful to take if you take the long view um it it kind of frees you up in a way, but there's another way in which if you do take the long view, then how we live right now really matters, how we treat one another, how we treat our planet, all of those things, because there, if you see consequences, you know, kind of karma consequences of your behavior and of everyone else's behavior and a sense really that we're all connected and very interconnected, which is, you know, the primary spiritual understanding in all traditions, then, then really right now does matter so much. But for me, who's kind of grew up, and I think maybe it circles back to the Holocaust memory that I carried with me, I always had a kind of terror of death and dying. And I and I that's shifted. So that's been a been a great gift. Um, even though, you know, the idea of these roles that we love so much and these people we love so much, that changes and impermanence, which is as you know, sort of central teaching in, in Buddhism and, and other spiritual traditions. That's, um, that's something we just, there's, there's a surrender to it, but there's a, there's a serenity in the surrender. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and we're human. So we do get attached. It's part yeah. of what we're here for. <laughs> we're here to learn. Yeah. Earth so school. Yeah. And um, tell us about where you can find your book. It's great. Even if you don't care about reincarnation, it's just a fun story. I think I'm going to hope my mom reads it too, because she loves murder mysteries. Oh, good. I have to tell you yesterday, I was very excited. I got an email, the Strand Magazine, which is an illustrious mystery magazine, named it one of the best 25, one of the 25 best mysteries of 2022. So that was very nice. Very that, nice. That came through yesterday. So that was lovely. Um, people can go to my website, barbaragrahamauthor.com, or it's widely available on Amazon, 
you know, indie booksellers. It's out there. It showed up a lot in airports um, when it came out over the summer. I don't know if it's still there, but it might be. But anyway, it's it's pretty easy to uh, get hold of. Wonderful. 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 I love it. And congratulations on that award. That will that will sweeten the pot when I recommend it to my mom because she's a connoisseur. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people who love mysteries seem to really like the book, even though it, it dwells on things that, you know, metaphysical that most murder mysteries do not. So I actually, Karen, I did a, an event with the Cuyahoga County Library over the summer in Cleveland that was great. And I think they have a lot of copies of it uh, at the Cleveland Library. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. It's been so fun. Really fun. Thank you so much for inviting me on your lovely, wonderful podcast. Thank you. Well, Elise, another podcast in 2023, and we will continue to bring your listeners some great conversations. And I want to wish you both a great day. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye-bye now.